Scott F. Parody, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Well, thanks for having me, John. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat with you today. We're going to be discussing leadership generally, but also more specifically, we're going to get into a discussion about values-based leadership and if leadership looks different in different types of organizations and how, how um, individuals can know the best approach uh, to the type of leadership style they might try to adopt uh, to be effective within their organization. As we get started today, I wanted to share Scott's uh, bio with the listeners. Scott F. Parody is a student of life and a seeker of ultimate truth. Uh, I just wanted to chime in on that. I, I think that's super cool. Um, I would also like to consider myself uh, a student of life and a seeker of ultimate truth. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, believing only once something is made simple, can we truly understand? He intends to discern, distill, and leverage the fundamentals of enduring wisdom. A native of New Hampshire, Scott completed a 30 plus career with a 30 plus year career with the United States Army, retiring at the rank of Colonel. In addition to varied stateside assignments, he completed tours in Europe and the Middle East. He served as a National Security Fellow with the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and as a Congressional Fellow with the United States Senate. He holds a Master of Science in Administration from Central Michigan University and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from the University of New Hampshire. He and his wife, a shining star, the formal, former Lisa Newcomb, currently live in Eagle River, Alaska. Scott and Lisa have two extraordinary adult children, Meredith and Mitchell. Uh, it sounds like you have a beautiful family, a storied, uh, successful career, uh, really a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, for us to connect today. And as we were talking about in the, pre, um, the pre-show the pre discussion, uh, I, I'm just so jealous that you live in Alaska and that you get to enjoy those beauties on a, just a regular basis. How, yes. how wonderful. Well, just before we, just before we get on the call, my wife went out to take the dog for a walk. She went three, three houses down and she ran into a moose in the park, in the driveway. So she turned around and then headed on back because you don't want to have a tangle with a moose. He didn't, he didn't take any uh, umbrage at her coming by, but it's always something to be careful of up here. Yeah. Well, I mean, what a fun thing. I, I like taking my dogs out on a walk, but I, I can confidently say that I have never and never will encounter a moose when I'm walking my dogs around my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, moose and bear, those are the two things we're always uh, keeping an eye out for. <laughs> Very good. And and I like, um, you know, we, we have some overlap and background. I, I ultimately did my PhD uh, in sociology, but my undergrad was also sociology. And then I got a master's of public administration. Um, I don't have any military service experience. Um, but it, it seems like uh, in the public service and in our sociology roots that we have a lot of connectivity there. And I think that will lead to some really interesting, fun discussions today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, before we dive in, anything else about yourself that you would like to share with the listeners? Well, I, as you had mentioned, I started in New Hampshire and, and the Army took me all over the place. And then I retired from the Pentagon. And I decided I wanted to get involved in something that would make a contribution, make a difference. So I started to put together educational programs, which amounted to books and then workshops and uh, online courses and that sort of thing. And then a few years ago, for family reasons, we were relocated from the D.C. area up here to, to Alaska. And now, but interestingly enough, since you're in Utah, my daughter is in Salt Lake and with her husband, who's in the Army now. And then my son is in Colorado. So... Uh, we are here continuing to uh, continuing the adventure. Well, wonderful. And Salt Lake is beautiful. Um, I love the national parks in Utah. So as much as I, I would love to go to um, Alaska to, to visit the beautiful sites, uh, I do try to make sure that I take advantage of the beauty around me here as well. Yes. Yes. Um, well, good. So, so today we're going to be talking about leadership. And I think you, you will bring a lot to the table, both through your military service, um, your public service generally, uh, and, and the work that you've been doing as a thought leader and uh, pulling together materials, uh, resources, education, educational materials and books and such, as you mentioned. Um, you've been wrestling with these topics for a really long time, both in practice and you know, more abstractly. And, you know, as you, as you self-describe yourself as the ultimate, as the seeker of ultimate truth, 
um, and distilling things down into like more manageable chunks of information that, that people can digest and then apply. I think that's what we're going for today. Um, so let's start there. And, and how would you define leadership? Like in a practical way, what is leadership? Yes. Well, that is a question I've wrestled with now for a long time because I think folks often misunderstand getting out ahead, the, the term leading with leadership. Because I would say leadership ultimately is much more, if I can use the word spiritual, it, it is inspiring people to be their best, to be their best selves, to fulfill their own potential. That's the ultimate, to me, definition of leadership. But a lot of folks, particularly folks in positions of authority, think, well, I'm out front, I have power, whether it's formal or informal power, therefore I'm leading. Well, that, they're not in most cases are not leading or don't understand what it means to lead. I, I like that a lot of folks use the definition of leadership is to influence. So to influence to accomplish a goal or a task. So I, when I'm talking to folks, I'll say, okay, let, let's think about this idea of influence for a, min, for a minute. So let's, let's say you're walking down the street and you see a, a group of shady looking characters to you, whatever that is. You are concerned as you approach those folks. So instead of approaching those folks, you decide to cross the street. So they have influenced you. Are they your leaders? Folks would say, no, they're not my leaders. Okay, so this idea of influencing to me is not really at the core of what leadership is about. Then when you think of leadership from a accomplish the task, which is what most people do. We're gonna accomplish the task. I'm gonna focus all these people to accomplish the task. The typical methods of accomplishing the tasks are carrots and sticks, rewards and punishments. So most folks in positions of power, positions of authority, will rely on carrots and sticks to manipulate people to accomplish whatever the task is, and they think that's leadership. That's not leadership to me. So what, what I'm trying to do is redefine or get folks to look at leadership a little differently. Leadership ultimately uh, I'll give you a little perspective on this. We, we are not, we say, okay, I'm, I'm in it for me. Yes, I get it. This me, I, but ultimately it's us and we. And that, we're never alone. It's always us and we. Just a bit of an aside, you think about business. And I ask people, are you in the people business? And some folks, depending on what they do, have a hard time with that question but ultimately everyone is in the people business. There is no other kind of business. All business is people business. So when folks think about leading or leadership, they think about how do I accomplish this task? Well, it's always in context of a we. So the we is leading is not about the leader. Leading is about the followers. What are the followers getting out of whatever this accomplishing a task is? And ultimately, if you think about leadership in the right way, the way I would say it should be thought about, it's what's in the best interests of the folks who are following. And that's what leadership is all about. Well, I love that. And I completely agree that ultimately leadership is all about empowering and lifting uh, and helping everyone, yourself as well as your team, the people that you work with, to fulfill their greatest potential. That's yeah. truly, that's truly at the heart of what it means to be a good leader. It's not about manipulation. It's not about carrots and sticks. It's not about um, fear. It's not about uh, even uh, persuasion and influence, though that could be a part of it. Um, it. But it's it's about authentic relationships with your people so that together you can lift each other. And, yes. and that does take vision. That does take someone to, to, um, to lead out. But it's, it's not the person being in front leading out in and of itself that's leadership. I mean, that, that could take lots of different forms and be completely dysfunctional and ineffective. Yes. Um, but a, a successful leader will start to kind of encapsulate all of these pieces together and recognize that they're not any better or out, you know, they're, they're not out in front of other people in the sense of everyone look towards me and I'm the end all be all answer for everything. And, um, and somehow they are above the, their people, that's not what we're talking about at all. Right. And, if, and if that's what um, leaders have in their mindset of what it means to be an effective leader, I think they're missing out. So a lot of what you were describing 
Another way of framing it is, which is something that I believe very strongly in, is servant leadership. Uh, the, the, the philosophy and principles of servant leadership, that we are willing to roll up our sleeves, uh, work alongside our people, that we're not above any, any of the work that they're doing. Um, it's not our job to micromanage, so we're not like doing their work for them or, or standing over them, telling them how to do their work, um, but it's, it's a matter of being willing to work with them and to, to do some of the stuff that perhaps isn't like the fun, sexy stuff that everyone likes to do. Like sometimes, yes. sometimes we all have to do kind of the grimy, crummy work, um, but a good leader will recognize the need to, to be there right beside their people and to lift and to, to support and to empower. Uh, so, so, so much of what you said just completely resonates with me. Um, and so then my question is though, because I don't think that's that complicated really. Right. Um, but my question is, why don't people do that? What, I mean, it's, it's actually pretty rare in my experience to see leaders who have that kind of a style within organizations. Yes. Part of it, I think, is this sense, and we in the United States in particular, we have this competitive sense about where am I going in my career or how do I get ahead? So we oftentimes put the, the me first, which we lose sight of this leadership. I say there are two types of leaders, and, and ultimately the job of a leader is to inspire. I like that word, inspire, to, to, so that people are inspired and lifted up, empowered, as you say. One of those types of leaders, however, is the innovator, the explorer, the, the person who is out there doing something that because simply by doing whatever it is they're doing, other people are seeing that and are inspired to move forward. Now that can go the gamut from that person who has some physical challenges and is really doing things that are exceptional, and we can see those across our society, to those people who are really the adventurer and the explorer. And just, just a little bit of an aside, I, if, you've ever, if you ever go and you, if you get up here to Alaska, you should go in the March time frame is the start of the Iditarod. It's a thousand mile sled dog race. And at the beginning of the Iditarod, they read off the bios of the racers. So here you have a person on a sled with 16 dogs and off they go a thousand miles into the wilderness. But one of the things that is humbling at that start is to listen to the accomplishments of those people. I mean, this is amazing. These are folks who have climbed all the highest peaks in the world, skied across Antarctica, are, are accomplished physicians or researchers, or these are just people who are overachievers. And here they are heading off into the wilderness with nothing but their sled and the 16 dogs, and I head back to the car, you know, it's pretty, co pretty cold out here. But it's, these folks are one type of leader, just by doing what they do, they inspire. So they cause people to move beyond their comfort zone. Then you have the relational type of leader, which most people think of is that accomplish something together, empower something together. But your question was, why don't leaders see this? I think ultimately we, we have to combat two fundamental instincts, components of human nature. One of those is fear. And we have this idea of, fear of loss, and oftentimes fear of loss, the most motivating fear of loss of somebody who has had some level of success in their career is status. I can't appear to have lost status, so I can't do the work on the line because I'll look like I'll be one of them. I can't get down in the trenches with the team because I don't want to be, I'm beyond that now. So this fear of loss of status, authority, they're, they're missing the boat with that. But then the other thing that most affects most of us is this, what I call our energy conservation device, which is this idea of beings, biological beings have this need to conserve energy. We want to conserve energy. And we do that by taking the easy route, the path of least resistance. So the easy route from a leadership perspective is, hey, you do this. Don't ask questions. This is the right thing to do. Just do this. So it's, to me, a combination of those two things, often associated with status. I've, I've got this position of status, and I don't want to risk that at all. And then this, it's just easier if you just listen to what I'm telling you, do what I tell you to do, and then I can get on. 
and so those to me are the primary reasons why folks don't step back and kind of really embrace what leadership is all about. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that. I think uh, position, status, power, control kind of all get wrapped up into each other, you know, wrap, wrapped up with ego uh, and, and all of that. Um, th then there's also, I mean, when you say it's easier, it is absolutely easier to take that approach in the short term. Yes. Ironically, it's actually way more work than if you actually empower your people and help them to learn to be autonomous and creative and innovative, because then you, you support them. You don't have to direct them because they're right. directing them. They're self-directed. Um, so in, in, in the long run, it's actually easier to, to take an empowerment approach but it, that takes some investment up front. And that's something that a lot of people aren't willing to do in part because we tend to have just a really short, um, like immediacy culture and like uh, a short time frame in terms of uh, how we view um, the way we interact with people and with the world, at least here in the United States we do. Um, other cultures have more long-term orientations, but we're pretty short term here. Um, and then I, th I think also, I think a lot of it's just people don't know any different. Um, so many people find themselves in leadership roles with no background, no training uh, in leadership. They're just, they just have expertise in some right. field. They, yes. they've, they've gone up the ranks because they've been really good at their job and eventually they find themselves in a leadership role, but they don't actually know how to lead. It's one thing to be a really good coder, um, but being a good coder doesn't mean you're gonna be a good leader of coders. Yes. Um, or whatever the specialty, you know, expertise is. And, and so then the default becomes what have they observed in their own experience from their own leaders. And unfortunately, we end up perpetuating a lot of the unhealthy behaviors uh, and approaches just simply because people don't know any different. So they're just mimicking what they've seen other people do. So, I mean, all of those things wrapped up together, I think, lead to why we don't have uh, more individuals taking this kind of an approach that we're describing towards effective leadership because you know it's really not rocket science um it, it's it's about building developing and maintaining relationships it's about open communication it's about humility it's about you know um just making sure that we're focusing on the needs of our people uh and you know that's half the battle if you can do that a lot of the other stuff starts to take care of itself um, so it, it's a good reminder, I think, for anyone who's listening to just consider, um, you know, their own style, how they approach different um, issues and challenges within the workplace, how they approach their people. Um, so something else that you talk a lot about in your work is, is values-based leadership. And that, of course, connects to what we've already been talking about. Um, but I'm wondering if we can go down that path now and talk a little bit more about what, what you mean by that and what that can look like uh, as we're trying to lead our people. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm going to bounce off of what you had just talked about, sure. this idea of folks, they'll start as a, let's say the example you gave a coder, and now you're the manager of coders. And a lot of folks, we don't have, it's a sink or swim. A lot of organizations, well, you know, we're going to promote Johnny, and if Johnny's good, then, then he'll last. If Johnny's not good, well, Johnny's going to find himself another opportunity. And unfortunately, it's that sink or swim mentality. Approaching folks who don't have a don't have a either good mentors good leadership already This is an interesting thing in the army one of the things that I and when I talk to junior folks in the military And I always ask them. Okay, are you gonna stay? And it always comes back to ultimately it comes back to the effectiveness of their leadership In other words if they're having a bad leadership experience in other words the team above that their their leaders are less than what they consider uh, great then they're saying, well, I'm probably gonna move on. However, if they're in this team that is functioning well together, then they say, yeah, I'm gonna stay with the Army. And then it, it happens really by assignment by assignment based on the leaders they have right there with them. But when I talk with folks who are cast into a leadership position, the first thing I ask them about, and, and it comes back to, we think of leaders in a work environment, but I try to go back to folks, go back to home. What were, what were your parents like? because that's your first experience with leadership. What kind of example did they set? How did they model? Did they build trust? Trust is the foundation of all human relationships. So going to your question now, more about values-based leadership, it's this idea of first understanding that we're in this together, 
And it's all about relationships and relationships are fundamentally built on trust. If you cannot build trust, then you're never going to have a, a fully functioning organization. So trust, what does it require to build trust? You need honesty, transparency, integrity, all of those values have to be embodied by that person who aspires to lead. Otherwise, why are the folks going to follow you other than if you have the carrots and sticks approach? Uh, pay you more, you'll get vacation, you won't have to work, those types of things. So this idea of now, and to your point, it comes back to who I am. As a leader, it's this idea of, and going back to my definition of leadership, is empowering people to be the best versions of themselves, which is growing as a human being. So for you to grow as a human being, then that means that those values of trust, integrity, honesty, do you exhibit those values? And is that something that's important to you? Or are you just competing to get ahead and ultimately it's me, me, me? And that's not the direction of leadership. So those core values to ultimately establish and maintain that foundation of trust are the keys to being a successful leader. I love that. I, I think all of those values are, are, are vital. Um, I, I think one thing that's worth noting here is that nobody's perfect. And so we're, it's not like we're saying these, these are the values you need to have to be an effective leader. And if you ever fall short, you know, in terms of you know, you're not a perfect um, example of integrity, then then you're you're in trouble. Like you're never going to be able to be an effective leader. That's not what we're talking about, right? But it, right. it's it's aspirational, yes. uh, and in it's it's understanding the importance of these values as they are foundational to human relationships, and and relationships are key to leadership. You can't be an effective leader without relationships. Uh, and so these values will feed into effective relationships, which will feed into effective leadership, which, you know, of course, then is, is as we've defined it, is, is empowering and helping your people become their best selves to, to fulfill their potential. Um, it doesn't require perfection. It just, it just requires sustained effort, yes. intentionality, and a willingness to to acknowledge if and when we do mess up, to acknowledge it, to apologize, to to course correct um, and to understand that this is going to be an iterative process for ourselves and for our people. But as we, as we develop that kind of a culture and we have a growth mindset, then actually that becomes a way to model for our people because you know what, we're not going to be perfect. They're not going to be perfect either. And if they see success in, in career and life as being a whole series of like linear growth with no um, um, steps backwards, or no deviations, you know, that's not realistic either. So, so everyone needs to understand that, yeah, if, if you mess up, own up to it, uh, apologize, try to fix it, move forward. And if they see their leader doing that, then they will be more inclined to do that. And that's just one more way to help everyone fulfill their potential. Yes, absolutely. I agree with, I agree with everything you said. Absolutely. The, this, this idea of fulfilling your potential, she, you, as you are putting that effort, you're growing yourself. So you're advancing and everyone else is advancing. And, and I think, and we see this all the time in our, across our society and in, in our organizations, people understand we're not perfect. So if you're willing to admit, I'm not per perfect, I don't have all the answers, we're in this together, or I screwed up, then they are going to be that much more willing to trust and follow you because they, they know that about themselves and they know that about, that we're, none of us are perfect. So let's go and work together. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, so so while acknowledging our imperfections and in, in effectively modeling that can actually help build greater trust, right? And it can help create stronger relationships because that's being authentic. That on the flip side of that, uh, the opposite is also true. When leaders think that they should never apologize, they should never acknowledge um, errors or mistakes because that somehow diminishes them in the eyes of their people, they got it completely backwards yeah. because. People aren't stupid. Like we can see when our leaders mess up. We, you know, I, I can easily acknowledge when I see someone uh, make a huge mistake and if they don't um, own up to it, then my, my feelings about them, you know, just take a nosedive. I, I, right. That's when I feel like these aren't people of integrity. Uh, these are people looking for scapegoats. They're people looking to pass the buck. 
they're not owning up to it and that's not modeling good behavior so i mean again it's not rocket science but it it you know just it just takes some self awareness and it 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 perhaps it seems a little bit um, counterintuitive to someone who's all about that power style of leadership, but being vulnerable and just owning up to your mistakes uh, is really, really important. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the, the keys for this idea of I'm not perfect, I make mistakes, but I'm growing too. And we're all in this together. Yes. Well, Scott, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. We're about out of time. This, this half hour just flew by. Um, but before we part ways today, I just want to make sure I give you a chance to share with the listeners how they can get connected with you, learn more about what you're currently doing. Um, you, you have um, some really great books that are out there that um, I would encourage my listeners to get connected with. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, I do have a, a website, scottfparody.com. I'm on LinkedIn for those folks who are on LinkedIn, Scott F, F as in Frank, Parody, P-A-R-A-D-I-S. I just, I just sent in an audio course with a Listenable, which is a, a new course offering system and some other things, but I'm on Udemy and, and I have my own offerings. However, the mo my most recent thing is I, I produced a book called Sheep's Herder, Sheep Herders Wolves, which is actually a fictional story, but it's the idea is to get back all everything we've talked about. I try to capture in this story of Sheep Herders Wolves. So it's a, it's a fictional story about a college student and a discussion he has with his grandfather about this idea of might makes right or the many serve the few, which are the two tenets of how human society unfortunately have struggled through the ages. And that is one of the, that's my most recent. But then I also have explosive leadership, which is getting this idea of the tenets of leadership, the values, this idea of inspiring people all in, in a volume. And, and uh, those are my two latest works, if you will, on, the, on these, this focus of leadership. But I welcome anybody to reach out to me if, uh, if they're so interested and we can continue this discussion. Yes, thank you, Scott. Um, I really encourage listeners to reach out to Scott, get connected. What a great resource, um, uh, so many great insights. And Scott, perhaps we can continue this discussion another time uh, because we only scratched the surface. We can go a lot deeper <laughs> into all these topics uh, and it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely, it's been, been a pleasure, John. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you and thanks to all the listeners. I hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Have a wonderful week and I hope everyone finds meaning and purpose at work every day. Thank you. <laughs>